This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In 1764, Horace Walpole bewitched an unprepared public with what's been claimed as the first ever Gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto. The poet Thomas Gray complained the novel made him afraid to go to bed o' nights, and wind-swept battlements, mysterious apparitions, and armour that goes clang in the night have haunted the dungeons of popular culture ever since. But Gothic is more than novels, and from under its swirling cassock, the Gothic revival in architecture became the state style for our empire, and the high camp of the monk reached the acme of seriousness under the influence of John Ruskin. So how did the Gothic style manage both to enthrall the public with sensation and form, quite literally, the pillars of the establishment? And why does a style forged in the spectral shadows of the Age of Enlightenment still hold so secure a position in popular culture today? With me to discuss the history of the Gothic is Chris Baldick, Professor of English at Goldsmiths College, London University, and author of Frankenstein's Shadow. Also with me is E.J. Cleary from Sheffield Hallam University, author of The Rise of Supernatural Fiction, and the writer A.N. Wilson, author of Eminent Victorians and God's Funeral. Chris Baldick, when Horace Walpole published The Castle of Otranto, he pretended it had been written by an Italian priest in the 12th century. Why did he do that? It was part of the game he was playing, really. The Castle of Otranto, we shouldn't imagine, is something really terrifying. It's, it's a kind of sport. Walpole was a, an antiquarian who liked playing around with things medieval or things slightly later than than medieval, so that um, when he published The Castle of Otranto, certain elements of it are playing around. Uh, It's not truly terrifying. He wanted to do a kind of spoof, a kind of forgery. There was a lot of forgery going on in the late 18th century literature, Thomas Chatterton and others pretending to have discovered old manuscripts. Uh, It gives it an air of something really antique, which, of course, it wasn't. Uh, Some curio from the past that had never been seen before, a window into the medieval world of cruelty and superstition. Can you, for those who haven't read Mm -hmm. it, can you briefly outline Mm -hmm. what the story is, The Castle of Otranto? Yes, it's quite a creaky story. It's it's pseudo-Shakespearean in a way, and it comes in five parts, but it's about a, a wicked aristocrat who has usurped the Principality of uh, Otranto from the, the true uh, line, uh, the true line of princes. Um, his son is bizarrely killed by a falling statue, uh, whereupon he decides he has to continue the family line so that his, his family will uh, possess Otranto forever. In doing so, he attempts to marry his prospective daughter-in-law, which is by most definitions, incestuous, um, chases around the castle and she escapes through various hidden passages uh, and eventually he comes to a, a sticky end and the lover of the, uh, the heroine turns out to be the true heir of Otranto and all ends happily. Has that been the template for Gothic fiction ever since? In certain respects, the essentials uh, remain fairly true, particularly two elements. One is the constricted environment, usually a medieval castle or monastery or similar sinister old building. And the other is the the persecuted heroine who is beset on all sides by fears, real or imaginary, that she's going to be put through something ranging from murder or rape through to forced marriage or forcible entry into a convent. Emma Cleary, why do you think the Middle Ages were so attractive to... uh people in this country at the end of the 18th century? Well, attractive is is possibly not the right word for it. There was certainly a fascination with the medieval past as a contrast with the present. Um, It was, if you like, uh, the shadow of modernity. So there was an attempt to um, look back to this past as a way of defining the features of the present. Before Walpole um, got going with his revival of literary Gothic. There were probably um, three separate meanings of Gothic. It is a, it, it's quite a, a complex and amorphous word um, with many meanings. And around this time, principally, they were negative. There was the sense of um, Gothic as a history of the Goths destroying the, uh, the classical Roman Empire. Um, and this was, a, of course, a specifically Enlightenment nightmare there was a more neutral meaning of Gothic as unfashionable, as um, something obsolete, and this related to neoclassical taste, um, the aesthetic branch of the Enlightenment. 
And then there was a more positive meaning um, of Gothic, the Gothic past of Britain, the idea that the invading Goths in the Dark Ages had brought to Britain a constitutional form of government and a spirit of liberty which needed to be preserved in the present. So there were there was paradoxical um, meanings um, floating about at the time that Walpole picked it up. Did Walpole pick up on Edmund Burke's argument in his ideas on the sublime and the beautiful, arguments about pain and terror? I quote a sentence, he said, Pain and terror, quote, are capable of producing delight, a sort of delightful horror, a seat of tranquility tinged with terror. You can see how that goes through to Coleridge, for instance, but is it, is it given a spin... Uh, by uh, the Gothic writers? Oh, absolutely, yes. Walpole certainly knew of, uh, of Burke's inquiry and the theories of the sublime. And, um, I mean, he wasn't absolutely the first to try and create effects of the sublime in literature. The pre-romantic poets, Collins, William Collins, Thomas Gray, uh, were experimenting with effects of the sublime already, effects of terror. But um, the difference is that um, Walpole in the Castle of Otranto set out on this new endeavour to combine effects of the modern novel, for instance, um, realistic characterization with the ancient romance and um, elements of the supernatural, most notably. So um, he was really attaching the idea of the sublime to the supernatural, re a revival of supernatural fiction. Ian Wilson, do you think we should see this fantastical side of the Gothic as a reaction against the Enlightenment? Is that how you say it? Well, I think it probably is in many senses. If you think of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, for example, he describes twice, once in his autobiography and once in the book itself, sitting in the ruins of the capital, the ruins of, uh, for an Enlightenment person, classical civilization, the ruins of uh, the, uh, an embodiment of reason, really and seeing these capuchin friars wandering where Cicero had once walked and where Caesar had once ruled, uh, singing as far as Gibbon is concerned their superstitious mumbo-jumbo, uh, their Gothic Latin, their dog Latin. Uh, th these sandaled uh, creeps, as far as Gibbon is concerned, triumphing, triumphing over the forces of reason. And that's very much, I think, how uh, a man of Gibbon's generation would have seen the Gothic in the way that uh, we've been discussing it. Do you think that someone like Anne Radcliffe with The Mysteries of Adolfo, which was uh, in 1794, wasn't it? That was the, a bigger success uh, than Walpole's book and could be said to have really, as it were, got the thing going in a, in, in, in a rather public way. Do you think there's any sense, I've read that she was trying to, not, or not, not consciously perhaps, but in some way trying to bring imagination back from the scientists, back from Newton, back into literature. Is there anything in that? I would have thought there was an element of that, but she was a very, very, very young woman when she was writing these novels, um, and so I don't think one needs to sort of regard her as a great sage. She was having some fun as well as perhaps making the kind of comments. I think one always needs to read Mrs. Radcliffe, who I regard as a supremely enjoyable novelist, alongside Jane Austen's spoof in Northanger Abbey. But, but I don't want to... not so far from it. I mean, they, so they both... Finally, endorse reason. I think the the the, the biggest mistake that's made in the, the, the misunderstanding of, of Gothic is to confuse it with full-blooded medieval nostalgia that you do get in certainly in German Romanticism and in different forms in English and Scottish Romanticism. Uh, it's not really that the Gothic writers, um, at least the ones we're talking about at the end of the 18th century, Mrs. Radcliffe and others, are trying to reassert the irrational against a reason that has become excessive or, or restrictive. They, they, they are, in, in a sense, celebrating a release from ages of barbarity and superstition. So that, but um, and there is it's, another thing. Mm. Actually, uh, the supernatural elements, the ghosts, the things that do bump in the night and so on, always turn out in the end to have a perfectly natural and rational explanation. That's right. So superstition is conquered at the end of the novel. Exactly, and, and we that's return part of the to, uh, they provide. We it? return to a reasonable Protestant world. Sorry. Could I come in with a couple of things there? I mean, one is that although Radcliffe was young, I think she was immensely ambitious for the novel and for. Um, romance specifically. She bulked out her novels with um, poetic landscapes description and this is what she was chiefly, chiefly famous for. She was also a poet and she included a large number of poems in the, in the novels too. 
and she was a master of suspense and of effects of the supernatural. So even though they may be explained at the end, they do depend very much on the sensation of superstitious terror. The second thing that I wanted to add was that the, su the supernatural fiction is, in large part, a necessarily a product of enlightenment, that while superstition remains a matter of belief, it's not possible, but it's only once it becomes a facet of entertainment, of uh, aesthetic sensation, that's actually something that's made possible by the enlightenment. Yeah. Is there a sense in which this was more driven by women than men? There is a feminist strand in Gothic, I think. Um, this is part of its oppositional quality. And I think people have mistaken ideas about the Gothic heroine. She's not always the helpless, fainting um, creature who needs to be rescued by a hero. Anne Radcliffe's heroines are actually very strong, and they wield the language of rights, which was very current at the time, obviously, in the context of the French Revolution, against the villains. And I think that's continued right up to the present. Um, I mean, Angela Carter's revisionist takes on, on um, gender relations through the fantastic, right up to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The interesting thing is the transition from Gothic, from this spoof novel by this man who built Strawberry Hill in, in 1764, and then less than 100 years later, about 80 years later, Palace of Westminster, the Houses of Parliament, are built in the Gothic, um, and they are the pillars of the establishment, and this is uh, Charles Barry and Augustus uh, Pugin. How is that transition made, Andrew Wilson? What do you make of it? Charles Barry wasn't particularly interested in the Middle Ages, and then when the, the competition came up to rebuild the Houses of Parliament were being burnt down in 1834, he submitted a sort of Tudor Gothic theme. And I think part of the reason for that was, in the 1830s and 40s, England was changing from being a basically aristocratic society to being a basically capitalist society, mm. uh, driven by industry, commerce and money. And I think a great many people wanted to disguise, both from themselves and from the populace at large, quite what was happening. Exactly, yes, and so they enjoyed the idea of building in the middle of London this fake medieval building. She looked and said, your, your high old aristocrats, which, who of course were jumped up middle class people like the rest of us, uh, who just dropped titles in the 18th century because they were richer than anybody else, were, were stretching way back to the old uh, mystic, misty Gothic times. And then when you had the genius of Pugin added to Barry's, uh, basically Tudor core, Pugin puts into it all these utterly fantastical but highly medieval uh, embellishments. And the House of Lords the chamber of the House of Lords, in which you so augustly sit, Melvin, is one of the most marvellous pieces of architectural fiction that's ever been dreamed up. What I think is wonderful is that Pugin became uh, converted to Catholicism, so Catholicism is smuggled inside I know. <laughs> the, uh, the British... And I remember the when, he had his, when he had his medieval hall at the Great Exhibition of 1851, there were tremendous complaints because they thought it was popery by the back door. He also ended in a madhouse, poor thing, remember. Well, I can't help feeling there's something quite sinister and self-denying about um, this popularity of the Gothic style, and I'm, I'm certain that John Ruskin, who was um, the chief prophet of medievalism in the period, was appalled by it. Um, John Ruskin was condemning the social consequences of the Industrial Revolution and presenting the medieval past as an ideal, something to be copied, but in its social structure, not in, simply in the, in, in the matter of style. And the use of Gothic to conceal railway stations and factories um, was anathema to him. Can we talk about uh, John Ruskin, Chris Baldick? Because he had a... He, uh, as has been suggested uh, or pointed out by Emma, um, proposed the Gothic for all sorts of moral reasons. So he became a moral force in, in society, as I understand it. I should first say that you've suggested a, a transition from Gothic fiction in the late 18th century to uh, neo-Gothic architecture and, and arguments around it in the mid-19th. But I, I can't see this as a transition. I see this as two distinct movements, which more or, less, more or less accidentally share the same name. Not entirely unrelated in that they're both, of course, concerned with ideas of the medieval... Um, largely distorted and simplified ideas of the medieval, but it's the valuations that count. Um, for Anne Radcliffe, for example, as a Gothic novelist, the Middle Ages, or actually in her case the 16th, 17th century, was um, uh, an, an area to be exploited that had imaginative possibilities, but in the end her attitude is, well, well we should be thankful that we've escaped from all that, that we're not, you know, our daughters are not forced into marriage, we can't be arrested arbitrarily, we are enlightened and modern. Um, Ruskin, uh, Pugin, and the other uh, proponents of neo-Gothic uh, 
architecture and art, and for that matter the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, all shared a much stronger positive valuation of medieval culture, um, either as an age of, of true faith or as an age of um, properly organized hierarchical social cohesion in which everybody was responsible to one another in social terms, in religious terms. Um, and, and also and in terms of, of the individual's ability to work at a craft. I think that was mm. the influence that Ruskin had on educated is. working people in this country, which was massive, not only in this country, yeah. in America and all over, but mm. that, that was a time as he saw it, idealised, no doubt, mm. and, uh, and, and sanitised, no doubt, when men and women, better as he was talking about men, could actually cut a gargoyle on a cathedral and have done a piece of proper work and not be a cog in a machine in a side of factory, and that mattered a lot to him. That's or, right. Both the fact of the individuality of it and the fact that it was a piece of craft. Well, I think there are two things there, aren't there? I mean, Emma's quite right to say that Raskin was not really associated with what, in the popular mind, we would call the Gothic revival in architecture at all. The reason he dro drove around Europe in that funny old antiquated uh, chaise of his father's, drawing Gothic buildings, Rouen Cathedral over and over again, Doge's Palace in Venice, was he was quite sure the Industrial Revolution was going to wreck Europe, and that he was going round recording a Europe that was going to be destroyed. He didn't like the idea, as Emma says, of Gothic railway stations or Gothic power stations. He thought they were an anathema, and indeed contradiction in terms. And what you're talking about, his passionate belief in craft and the idea of the guilds, and in a way it's the origin of the Union trades union movement. Of course, Rastrian's idea of the way that the working uh, man was united with his comrades became very different later on, uh, particularly under the influence of William Morris. And I mean, Morris is, I think, the key figure here. But Morris takes on from Ruskin. Who ta takes on from Ruskin. And I think Ruskin's idea, I, I would dispute you, you, rather, I think Ruskin's idea of, of work and of the way men well, did come from the Middle Ages, from his idea of oh, the Gothic did, Middle yes. Ages. But I was just talking about the specific business of Gothic styles. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's all I meant. The work is, is central to Gothic as Ruskin conceives it, because it, he presents really a new notion of what Goth, the term Gothic should mean, the, nat his essay, the nature of Gothic. Um, and for him, it's, it's about the medieval culture as an entire way of life which respects people's work. Now, his starting point is clearly the extreme division of labour that he sees in the factory system, a shocking new system, which we're now used to, but Ruskin certainly wasn't, his generation. So he, he, he thinks up or looks back into the past for a model of something that is saner, uh, more humane than that. Uh, by various forms of exaggeration, then he uh, reconstructs how Gothic cathedrals, in, in the true sense, 12th century cathedrals, uh, were built or must have been built. The role played in that construction by the artisan, the craftsman, the stonemason, and uh, proposes that the, the working man of the 12th century had greater freedom because he could express himself in his little corner of the cathedral, but in his own way, whereas the factory worker in Manchester or in a cotton mill couldn't possibly do so. Now, that, that, has a, uh, that argument has a moral charge. It has questionable historical basis. Can we move to this century? Oh, no, last century now, to the 20th century. Um, <laughs> Gothic style did another leap, really. Uh, it, let's just concentrate a little bit on films. Do you think that the, it carried the same idea into the movies, the same ideas, or did it reinvent itself for the movies? Well, obviously, yes, film has been the um, uh, defining medium for Gothic in the, in the 20th century and has established an icon iconography, um, which to some extent has become detached from the narratives themselves. In a way, what we've had since the expressionist cinema of Germany or um, the great classic horror films of the 1930s, Frankenstein and Dracula, is a kind of semiotics of Gothic. Certain images which have become part of the popular common, common currency, they're, they're part of the language Such that we as. speak about ourselves. Well, if you simply see a set of fangs or a bolt through the neck, I mean, that instantly conjures certain ideas about society, I suppose. If we include Frankenstein within the Gothic genre, then um, it really it's become one of the fundamental concepts, concepts that we think by. The scientist, the uh, arbiter of reason, produces a monster who then returns to haunt and destroy him. 
And you see that image turning up in so many different contexts. On the one hand, it's become as uh, cosy and familiar as a cup of tea, and I'm sure that Frankenstein's been used to sell tea at some point. Breakfast cereal, <laughs> Breakfast cereal certainly. <laughs> but... Um, on the other hand, it still seems to be capable of provoking a moral panic in the recent case of the Frankenstein foods, evidently. And then another of the key texts, surely, is Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which perhaps isn't a... I mean, I, I think it's a marvellous book and is one of the texts we haven't discussed, but has its influence, certainly, when translated into the medium of film. I mean, how many Dracula films are there? Thousands, probably. And they've, that certainly influenced, I would have thought, the, the Gothic style in terms of clothes, fashion, lifestyle, to use a horrible word. How, how far do you think that the uh, presence of the erotic in Gothic has given it its stretch, its long as its reach, Andrew? Well, I very much think the castle of Otranto and the whole world around Walpole starts off as a highly erotic joke. But it's Might. erotic camp, isn't it? It's erotic camp. camp. Yeah. But, I mean, certainly modern Goths are intending to be, and uh, in my case, it seems to be sexually attractive. I mean, they, uh, I think it, it is fantastic, women who look like Mrs. Munster. And indeed, the whole Munster family, I think, are very erotic in their way. But, of course, there's a, you're smiling, and there's an element of comedy as well. But, yes, I think that the, the Gothic is meant to be erotic, it's in the sense we're talking about it, I mean. I don't mean John Ruskin, he was a poor fellow, not very erotic. But, um, <laughs> but uh, and probably not Sir Walter Scott either, really. But uh, in, the, in the sense of the Gothic novel, Gothic fantasy and Gothic film, yes. Dracula, centrally. Um, and Dracula falls the, into... Exactly, the, the, the figure of the vampire is the sexiest figure in the, in the tradition, which originates essentially with Byron. The notion that the original vampire is a kind of lady killer which is a term that actually appeared in Byron's lifetime as uh, a figure of the, the irresistible seducer, particularly an aristocrat, which is the most uh, attractive or glamorous kind, who sweeps in in his cape or whatever and whisks you off to his castle when you can't escape. <laughs> These kinds of games and fantasies are crossover from popular, certainly Hollywood, versions of Gothic into camp spoofs, into subcultural fashion codes. Uh, what gives them the longevity? Because we seem to very often to be quite content to have the same images, the same aristocrats in long cloaks going to the same castles yeah. with the same helpless And you see them maidens. walking up and down any high street in Europe, more or less, too. It's, it's reassuring. I think that, that it's a mistake to think that there's something in Gothic that is absolutely terrifying. That, that it's really there's something in Gothic that is reassuring, and it's reassuring because we're, what we're doing with Gothic, particularly with vampire stories, is uh, in our imaginations killing off a nasty past, the past in which, um, as we imagine it, uh, some aristocrat could just sweep, sweep us away arbitrarily without us being able to answer back, lock us in a dungeon or something. That's, that's our very simplified modern view of the past and what's bad about it, and we like to rehearse it. And we've learned a formula, the, the dagger, the, the stake through the heart or the jolly or whatever it might be, to get rid of it. I'm, th I'm sure Chris is right about that. And to you that extent, of course, there is a political undertone. It's a, it's a cosy and middle-class fantasy. Yes, middle class fantasy. Well, you need to remember, though, that Dracula was born at pretty much the same moment as psychoanalysis. I and, was going to um, come to that. Yes. Do you read my thoughts? <laughs> 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 I was going to say, did Freud actually give this an extra charge? Absolutely, yes, I think so. Um, and the familiar plots of Gothic right from the 18th century were easily assimilable into psychoanalytic theory absent mothers, incestuous fathers, it's all there, and I you think that... You could put it the other way around, of course, and say that Freud is the last Freud of the Gothic novelists. Yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed, and he was, he was, um, it, some of his theories actually came out of readings of Gothic texts, E.T.A. Hoffman's The Sandman being the obvious example for the uncanny. But yes, I mean, it has give it, given it an added legitimacy, an added charge, and in a way sort of rationalised it for the 20th century. Is there anything that, that the Americans have brought to the Gothic? I mean, it's the American movies we're talking about, mm -hmm. and on American television series and so on. Is there an American Gothic that there's, we can discuss in such terms? There's a very strong American literary tradition of the Gothic, from Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne, both masters of the short story in, in the 1830s, through to living novelist Toni Morrison would be an example in the late 20th century before her, again in the American South which is the, the hotbed of Gothic writing, William Faulkner, the, the, the master of Southern Gothic in the 1920s and 30s. That's, that's been a very strong tradition. There are even those uh, historians of American literature who've gone so far as to say the whole tradition of the American novel is Gothic. I think that's, that's an exaggeration but it does 
Um, is Henry James rather high and dry, doesn't he? Yeah. Well, the, Henry James, master of the, of the ghost he, story. Of course, of course he had a marvellous ghost story, yes. Mm. It's almost as if America was invented to receive Gothic. But to say it's, it regards itself as a civilization, quite rightly in most terms, as a civilization that has escaped from European ancient forms of tyranny. There are no castles, everything is reasonable, it's a democracy. Um, the, there is no state religion that you can be dragooned into. Uh, so therefore, it's an enlightened civilization. But um, like other enlightened civilizations, it has to go back and repeat its moment of separation from the dark past. That's why I think it's so good. Hollywood was so good at doing Dracula as Frankenstein. Eventually, the, the Adams family and the whole popular cycle that comes out of that. It's it's the dark past that it's grateful to to escape from. It can, America, I think, can do it more convincingly than, than Europe can. Do you think that uh, there's still some element in, let's call it American Gothic, that's reacting against the society? And if so, what, what is that? I mean, certainly in youth culture, in, um, in the continuing success of the goth music scene, there is a declared opposition to the status quo, I suppose primarily to the Bible Belt aspect of uh, American culture. Whether this is effective or not, I think, is um, in debate even within the goth scene. I mean, what's fascinating about it, in a way, is this self-monsterizing, the way that they dress as the hate figures that they would be set up to be anyway. So they kind of short-circuit the argument in that way, uh, and I think that's what's um, what's problematic and perhaps self-defeating about it. That's quite a witty thing to do with one's life, mm. isn't it? If one's going yes. to be horrible and adolescent anyway, just to exaggerate it. Is it, do you think, that uh, they're, they're doing in psychological terms what Chris says the Gothic novel uh, does anyway, which is actually something rather reassuring. They are identifying what other people are afraid of, perhaps what they're afraid of in themselves, in order uh, to contain it. And then, of course, when their Gothic yes. phase passes, they... And caricaturing it, as, and as caricaturing we said right it. from the start, yes, there is an element of and play. And they can put always. away their white makeup and their hair dye mm. when they reach the aged uh, state of 25 or 30. Do you see it as an adolescent stage? It's obviously closely, it, it's almost perfect, isn't it, for, for adolescent gloom and melancholy to dress up in black and, and wipe your face and, and look like a corpse or uh, something back from the dead. Um, but it's it, clearly it's a way of resisting, I think in an American context especially, a sort of compulsory cheerfulness that, that uh, animates the culture at large. That's Everybody one of the in, things in one likes about it. Yeah. Right, going back from to the Charles of Otranto to the young American or European goth, is that it does resist cheerfulness. It resists that horrible have a nice day, smiling. Everything's positive and only up. But accentuate the, the positive. Have that. The Absolutely. Goth, I think, would prefer to be a decadent European aristocrat particularly the novels of Anne Rice, which are spectacularly successful, which have this cult following. And they are to do, really, with the glamour associated with deviance, with homosexuality, with deadliness, with being outside of any orthodox uh, frame of, of, of behaviour. It's fascinating that that camp element persists. Yes, I mean, in, in, camp is important, but I wouldn't want to lose the question of terror as well. From its beginnings as a sort of jokey novelty, a one-off, terror, it, the production of artificial terror is now a multi-million dollar industry. And um, one has to ask, why? Why this demand for terror? Why this addiction to it? And ask what kind of consequences that has. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Anne Wilson. Thank you, Hannah Cleary. And thank you, Chris Baldick. Next week, I'll be looking at the history of mathematics with Ian Stewart and John Barrow. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.